to beautiful downtown Burlington, Vermont, and Phoenix Books. It's a beautiful Thursday evening, and we have a great event for you all tonight. It's uh, Guido Maze, the Wild Medicine Solution. Uh, Guido is a native of Vermont, at least he is now. We're going to claim him as our own. And he works at the um, Vermont Center for In Integrative Herbalism. Um, and I know that the herbalism as a field of study is growing tremendously. More and more people are interested in this topic. Uh, we are really happy and honored, actually, to have Guido, who's uh, got his first book here. And I'm sure you're all going to have a great time. So welcome, Guido Maze. Thanks, Todd. Um, thank you all for coming. It's it's really great to be here in Vermont and uh, be able to talk about herbal medicine with you guys and see so many familiar faces here um, and see folks from the Vermont Center for Integrative Herbalism coming out here and representing the great, amazing group of students that I get to work with every day. Um, but I wanted to just spend a, a little bit of time talking about what I did with this book and what it meant to me and what it's about um, and really open it up to questions or specifics that you might have on the topics of herbal medicine um, or anything that you've seen in the book or just curiosities you have about plants and how they fit in with human beings, right? And that's ultimately what the book is about for me is, you know, my wife and I uh, moved here in about 1996 and we started working on soil in central Vermont and um, we were deciding what to do and, you know, produce farming is crazy work, I just have to say. I have amazing respect for people who can do that and can maintain that lifestyle because it's really difficult. So we thought, um, let's grow something that's perennial, right? Something that, you know, you don't necessarily have to plant every single year. And uh, let's see what we can find in the forest, right? We had both um, been studying herbal medicine a little bit. Um, I'd been traveling around the country learning about plants from whomever I could really find um, that was willing to talk to me about it. And so we settled in Vermont and started growing on, you know, roughly about an acre of nice clay Vermont soil, right? Um, a lot of these medicinal plants. And, uh, you know, so that was kind of some of the most profound, I would say, learning experiences that I had was really working directly with these living beings. And the more I did that and the more I walked in the forest and, and had these incredible experiences finding mushrooms out there in the woods and turning around and having, you know, two does looking at me as I was there trying to cut a shelf mushroom off a tree. And I don't know, it changes you in a way that I find really powerful and um, really profound and, and really important and helped mold me and, and my philosophy of life and my outlook to life. And in the process, it also helped keep me healthy. And, you know, it helped keep, I think, people in central Vermont. I started selling some herbal extracts um, at farmer's market. And I, th I think it helped maintain and even treat some disease problems that people were experiencing there. And as I started practicing this more and more, I began to really realize, you know, this is the stuff right here, you guys. These plants have been our friends and our allies for thousands of years. And I started remembering that as I was growing up in Europe, I, I, I lived in Italy for a long time. We were just talking about this till I was about 14, kind of um, in the Alps, but also in this Renaissance town called Ferrara that's about half an hour south of Venice. And you know, herbal medicine is just part of life there. And it hadn't really ever hit me until I realized that it was missing. You know, do you ever turn around and you've kind of had a habit all your life and then you move somewhere else or circumstances change and it takes you a while to figure out that like something is not there anymore. So it really kind of hit me that um, these allies and these plants were missing in my life and how grateful I was that they were back, right? But then I thought, you know, what about the rest of the American culture? It's probably the only culture in the world where these allies are not a part of daily life, where when you get sick, you don't brew a tisane the way we did in the Alps. You know, you don't make this elderflower tea. You go get Dayquil, which is, you know, maybe fine and somewhat effective, but it's, it's different from the way, you know, 75 to 80 percent of the people of the world handle their basic health and disease problems. Um, so my mission has been, you know, in the work that I've been doing in teaching and in clinical practice, um, uh, my day job is, uh, you know, twofold. I um, am a teacher, so I help learn together with students about how herbal medicine works and how we can apply it to folks in effective ways. And then I also am a practitioner, which means that, you know, folks um, sit in the office with me and, and we get into a conversation for an hour or two and we try and match these beings, these green beings, these plants, with these two-legged beings, the humans, in a way that works, right, that helps make them feel better. Um, and I found in doing this work that, 
you know, there's some plants that are really, really powerful. Okay? I mean, you can take uh, an extract of belladonna. I wouldn't recommend doing that without supervision. Um, but, you know, there are also plants that are very, very safe and that can be used by anyone for a broad range of issues. And I started thinking to myself, and this actually hit me one day when I was running. Um, I was actually running the Burlington Marathon at the time, and I'm about mile, I can't remember exactly where it was, I think mile 14, 15. I was like, there's this guy, Samuel Thompson, in the 1800s, and he had this great plan, you know? He said, let's just give everybody Lobelia and Cayenne and Valerian, and it'll really solve all of their problems. He was dealing with frontier medicine, right? Really hardy folks who were ending up with infection and, you know, stomach disease. And his idea was basically make them all puke and then relax them with valerian, right? <laughs> and he sent these kits out, and they were really, really effective, right? And um, he did very, very well, and he was able to help a lot of people in a really good way. So I thought to myself, you know, this is just not a strategy for the 21st century. But could there be such a strategy in the 21st century? What's really missing? What's sort of the distillate of the amazingly complex and, I would say, deep art and science of herbal medicine that we can really distill it out in a way that is as simple and as understandable as what Samuel Thompson did in the 19th century? So I was running around and I was thinking, like, well, you know, one class of plants that's really important are the ones that help with mental health, mental and spiritual health. When we feel super tight or tense, right? and when we feel despondent and sluggish and underactive. These are things that people experience on a daily basis that I've seen folks walk into my office complaining of these issues over and over again. And I don't blame them. Life is crazy, right? So I thought to myself, like, there are these plants that herbalists call nervines, but what's the common thread amongst them, right? What's the common thread? You think of plants like peppermint or lemon balm. You think about roses or skullcap. All these plants have a lot of essential oils in them. They're highly scented and aromatic. And looking into the science of it a little bit, I found that the effects of these chemicals that present this aroma to our nose is really subtle, complex, and powerful on the internal musculature of the human body, especially on our hollow organs and on our arteries. They help relax tension, but they also help wake up underactivity and stimulate stuff. Think about ginger tea, right? Wakes up underactivity, gets you going a little bit. At the same time, think about something that's very soothing and relaxing, like lavender, right? It tends to relax tissue. But if you're really out of it and you feel really sluggish, lavender will actually wake you up and will make you feel more inspired and more creative. So I thought to myself, these aromatic plants, these plants that have smell, are kind of the key, it seems like, to human health from a mental health and spiritual health perspective. And then I thought about it from an anthropological perspective, right? Every ceremony that human beings engage in features some form of these plants. And when that clicked in my head, I was like, wow, there's something going on here. This is one really important class of plants that humans have used forever and ever. Think about, you know, the stories of the birth of Jesus, right? Frankincense and myrrh. Why? Great offering. Why? What's the most important transition a human will experience? Well, certainly the first one, right? The transition from the uterus to the outside world. This is potentially somewhat stressful, right? <laughs> And having these aromatic plants, yeah, both for the mother and for the baby, are considered super important. Anthropologists have looked at this and they've said, oh, you know, they bring the aromatic plants in because it smells bad. And, you know, I wouldn't say it smells amazing in the labor and delivery room, but I, highly, I don't think that that's the major reason why these aromatic plants were there. I think that they have this smell and this scent that kind of ushers the baby in into this environment that helps them feel more relaxed, and it also helps relax the mom. And you put these two things together, it works, it helps. And that's why it's persisted culturally, at least that's my opinion, um, in human civilization. And then there's this great pharmacological basis for it, which I talk about in the book, why this stuff does what it does, why it really all makes sense. So I'm going on and I'm thinking, well, okay, that's one kind. We really need, you know, three is a good number. So um, what's, what's another kind? And, and you know, I, we'd, been, we'd been working a lot with bitter plants and thinking about bitter plants. Um, I worked with Jovial at Urban Moonshine, and you know, bitters were kind of the first thing that we did um, and that we focused on a lot. Bitter plants are really important for digestion. And again, you know, I was reminded of growing up in Italy where they use aperitifs, digestive bitters, all the time. In fact, every culture except the American culture features the use of bitter plants in one way or another. And I thought, you know, what do the bitter plants do? Well, they, they help all digestive problems. 
And certainly, I would say the majority of people who walk into my office complain of some kind of digestive problem. Or they say, you know, yeah, you know, I, I experience constipation a couple times a week, but that's normal, right? I say, well, it doesn't have to be normal. We have dandelion root and yellow dock root, and it really helps with these things. So maybe because of what we eat in this culture, maybe because of the level of stress we experience on a daily basis, people's guts bug them, right? And bitter plants are, are really a big part of the solution for that. And what you see from a pharmacological perspective is that our bodies are exquisitely tuned to perceiving the bitter flavor. We recognize food based on the bitterness it contains. In fact, you know, 50,000, even 2,000, even 200 years ago, any food that the average human being would consume would contain a lot of coarse fiber, roughness, and bitterness. Since we've been able to effectively mill grain to a refined white flour and make cake for everybody, we've kind of run with that. And I really don't blame you know, human beings for doing that. But just as we've started to recognize that exercise is important for the body, that we're not just supposed to sit on our butts all day, we should also start learning to recognize, I think, that um, a little bit of bitter flavor, a little bit of challenge for the tongue and for the digestion is a really important part of how to keep ourselves healthy. So, you know, bitter plants, I thought, this is great. It's going to really help people with a range of digestive problems, just like the aromatic plants with a, help with a range of mental and spiritual problems and tension and stress and depression, right? Um, but bitters go further, just like the aromatic plants go further, into our physiology. When you look at the pharmacology, when you look at the science of it, they are also sort of a gentle daily detoxification for our body. And there's a lot of authors, you know, I think of Florence Williams first and foremost, who wrote um, Breasts, A Natural and Unnatural History. She was on a quest to try and figure out how to breastfeed her daughter without exposing her daughter to plasticizers and pesticide residues and all the stuff that's in our environment. And her conclusion, I hate to tell you, is you can't escape this stuff. We've put it in the world, we've put it in the environment, and I'm afraid that we can't really get rid of it anymore. But my thesis, or my hypothesis at least, is that uh, the human being is resilient, adaptable, can handle this stuff if we have these plant allies as part of our life. And looking at how bitters work on our liver, they really help our liver detoxify and metabolize xenobiotic or pesticide-based, plasticizer-based chemicals that we ingest on a daily basis. So the idea of detoxification is one that, you know, it's a kind of have a love-hate relationship with it because I don't believe we're dirty, right? I was raised Catholic and struggled with the concept of original sin for a long time. And I don't know that I really buy into it fully. Um, but what we're seeing now, especially in the natural products world or the alternative medicine world, is this idea that you have to detoxify your dirt. And I get where they're going, you know, but I'm not a subscriber to the, you know, once a year or twice a year super intense colon cleanse, radical fast business. It's kind of like saying, you know, and I was talking about this last night, if you want to lose weight, go on a, you know, zero calorie diet for two weeks once a year and exercise like crazy. It's not really going to work too well for you, right? So again, these bitter plants provide us with ongoing gentle daily detoxification. So improvement in a range of digestive problems and a way to buffer the chemical barrage that we experience on a daily basis. I thought this is another really good, um, really good thing for the American public, really good thing for the Western diet, right? And then the idea of tonic plants is the last one that kind of rounds it out. And, and this is super unique in herbal medicine. It's the idea that you might want to take something on a daily basis. You might want to eat something or drink a tea or consume a jam on a daily basis, even if you're not sick. And a nutritionist would say, well, of course, you want to eat good food. And that makes sense. But I think you want to do more than that. You want to get something that is more than the sort of somewhat hybridized vegetables that we consume on a daily basis. You look at the chemistry of a tomato or an iceberg lettuce or even a romaine lettuce and you compare it to a dandelion leaf, it's very different stuff. No one has messed with the dandelion leaf for hundreds of thousands of years. It's got the same level of nasty bitterness that it had when we were chimpanzees. Okay? And I think our physiologies need that stuff. Not to say that fruits and vegetables aren't super important, but I think these trace chemicals, these phytochemicals, that we haven't identified as vitamins, right? You know, and why haven't we identified them as vitamins? You know, we know vitamin C is important. You get scurvy if you don't get vitamin C. We know vitamin D is important. You get rickets, your bone gets all messed up, especially as a child if you don't get vitamin D. 
You don't get B vitamins, especially B12. You develop anemia in the course of a couple of months. So the obvious stuff, we've checked that off the list, right? We know we have to eat this stuff. But what about the things that take multiple generations to show effects, right? And that's where I think the tonic plants come in. Diabetes, type 2, obesity, our difficult relationship with sugar and carbohydrate, cancer, cardiovascular disease. When you look at what these tonic plants can do to those problems, if you're like me, you might start to get the idea that they're really symptoms of a plant deficiency syndrome that have taken three or four generations to show up. Why? Because it doesn't happen as fast as a vitamin B12 deficiency. It happens when a mother has a deficiency that then modifies the genetics of her developing fetus in utero through a process called epigenetic modification. And then their kids who eat fewer plants have an altered relationship to food and an altered relationship to inflammation and cardiovascular health. And then their kids, and the process perpetuates itself, you know. So the, the thought that I put out is, you know, if we're talking about um, an experiment where we would withdraw tonic plants from a population, we need a really big population, we need to alter their um, diet, where they go from, you know, a couple of hundred plant species, half of which are wild, down to seven or eight plant species, and we need to watch them for a couple hundred years and see if diabetes and heart disease and cancer start to increase. And I kind of think that we are the guinea pigs in this experiment. And it's very natural, right? The Industrial Revolution gave us the ability to refine all our food and make it super sweet and tasty and not work our bodies anymore. And we took those promises and those ideas and we ran with it. To the point where now 80% of our calories are supplied by seven plant species or eight plant species, at the top of which are wheat, corn, and soy. Heirloom vegetables are falling by the wayside almost every day. And nobody goes out and picks dandelion greens anymore, unless you're somewhat crazy. <laughs> and what I hope is that we can be a little more crazy, right, you guys? Because what herbal medicine offers is, yes, some really intense plants like belladonna that you, know, you really should use under the advice of an experienced herbalist. But it offers these amazing, super safe, weedy things that grow everywhere that are like pushing out of the sidewalk to make themselves known to us, right? And I'm not saying harvest those for your medicine. <laughs> but still, you probably all have lawns and you find these plants in there somewhere, right? They're these allies that we have had for thousands and thousands of years. And I think they miss us and are trying to say, hey, you guys, you're rushing forward super fast. You're like kids at Christmas, you know? You got great toys and you are playing. And I love it. But listen, we grew up together. We shaped your physiology. And we want to help you move forward into the future in a way that is sustainable. So what I really love about the herbalist message and, and the message that I try to bring out in this book is not fear of progress, not fear of the modern world. The modern world is awesome. And I was joking about it last night, and you know, maybe my daughter will walk on Mars one day. And the thought of that to me is, it blows my mind and I love it. If that's what she wants to do, more power to her, right? If we can build a spaceship that would take us there, Sweet. But we can't do it without these sort of green tendrils that have been part of our life forever. Because what are we, you know? We think of ourselves as individuals, but we're really not. We're part of an ecology. So it's kind of like saying to a human body, yeah, you've got a heart and it's great and it works really well. Let's take it and put it over here. It doesn't really need the brain anymore. Or let's take it and put it over here. It doesn't really need the liver anymore. And that's what we do have done to the ecology of which human beings are a part. We said, human beings, they're great. They don't need to be enmeshed in nature anymore. They don't need to be enmeshed in the ecology. And I don't think that that's true. But I don't think we have to go back to the Stone Age to achieve this goal. I think we can move forward with modern life, but bring our plant allies with us. right? And that's why I think herbalism is positivist stuff. It says, don't be afraid of refined carbohydrates. Don't be afraid of electromagnetic radiation. Don't be afraid of the chemicals that we've polluted our environment with. Certainly try and find some solutions to all that stuff. Moderate your carbohydrate consumption. Avoid dumping gasoline everywhere on your lawn. Avoid the use of Roundup. That all makes sense. But rather than trying to put ourselves in a bubble, which we'll never be able to do, my feeling and what I've seen in clinic 
is that if you bring these plants in that are super safe, you'll be able to withstand the adaptive pressures that modern life has put on us. And it's really amazing to me, you know, it's the stuff that is enmeshed in our folklore, it's the stuff that is enmeshed in our physiology, and it's growing all around us and it's super easy. The other thought that really, you know, put it over the top for me in terms of writing this book was that I live in Vermont. And Vermont, you might have seen this, Strolling of the Heifers just put out their um, list of locavore, the states with the strongest local food systems. And Vermont is number one, which of course, you all can believe. We have great food systems here, great local food production, great local agriculture, amazingly diverse and rich farmers markets, amazing natural food stores that have incredible produce and incredible meat and incredible bread, right? But you walk into these stores and they've got these supplement sections in plastic bottles made in industrial factories, who knows where, employing a lot of carbon to get all that stuff here. And people purchase huge amounts of this stuff, the same people who are really into local food. And that didn't really click in my head. I was like, what's going on here? A solution to that is that we can grow local medicine, you guys. We can grow local medicine. And it's really easy to do. In fact, you probably have dandelions growing in your garden right now, trying to get up and out. And it is super easy to pull them out, chop their roots, and put them in vodka. It's as simple as that. And you have a bitter tonic to take before meals to encourage daily detoxification and help with many digestive problems. Okay? So, positivist medicine from herbal medicine. Things that say, don't be afraid, just bring your friends along. And friends is a nice word, but really, I think it's more accurate to call these plants our parents. And from an evolutionary perspective, they are. They've directed our development. They've molded our internal organs because we've been eating them since before we were human. And the research on this is amazing. You know, they're studying chimpanzees and the way they use medicinal plants, and it is pretty fantastic to see. Neanderthal tooth scrapings, where they find residues from chamomile and yarrow, not food plants. These guys aren't eating these because they're hungry. You try and feed yourself with chamomile and yarrow, you're going to have, an, a, you're going to have a really hard time. <laughs> so they're taking it for other reasons, right? And that's because these plants make them feel good, and it's because their physiologies need them to function optimally. So yes, you know, pollution, carbohydrates, refined sugar, all that stuff, we definitely should keep an eye on it. Technology and screen time, all of that for our mental health, we should definitely keep an eye on it. But I think... As important as that craziness of the modern world, the deficiency of the plants that we've always had as part of our lives is as much a part of the problem as anything else. And maybe because I'm lazy, maybe because I don't like being afraid, I feel like I'm much more gravitating towards the idea of bringing those plants into my life rather than trying to find out all the bad things and, and cutting them off. It's also because I kind of like screen time a little bit and I think the stuff is pretty amazing. Right? So maybe I have a little bit of self-interest. But what I found is that, you know, if I take an aromatic tea of linden at night when I'm trying to sit down and, and write, I get into the flow of events much more quickly. I get into focus, I lose the tension of the day, and I'm right there in the present moment. And that's what these plants are helping me to do, just like they help during ceremonies. And people have employed them for thousands of years for that purpose. Um, so that's why I call it the wild medicine solution. Not all the plants are wild. You know, garlic needs to be cultivated. Ginger needs to be cultivated. Chocolate wild, but it needs to be processed pretty heavily. You know, you're not going to just eat the beans inside a cacao pod. But the point, I think, what you, what you get is that these are plants that haven't been hybridized and haven't been tinkered with by humans. They're the same way they were when we were evolving into humanness. So they provide the chemistry that our internal organs are used to experiencing from an evolutionary perspective. And if we bring them back in, it is a solution, or at least part of the solution. Don't run with technology 24-7. Don't spray gasoline all over your lawn, obviously. But you can handle some of the craziness of modern life if you have the traditional allies. And aromatic, bitter, and tonic plants, they're three super safe categories of plants that won't interact with pharmaceuticals, that are really ridiculously easy to grow. And that's the, what I've tried to do, is you know, make this really accessible and really safe. So you can start using the plants that I talk about in this book right away and find them in your yards, and find them in the forest. And if you can't find them, plant a little lemon balm seed in a pot on your porch or on your windowsill. 
you'll have this amazing plant that makes this really delicious tea and it just it just wakes your heart up in winter when the nights are really dark and it's really cold and you're like oh my goodness it's only January <laughs> which is a very natural response but if you have these allies with you I think you'll fare a whole lot better and um, that's what really compelled me to write the book and when I was doing it I really felt like it was writing itself and I almost felt, you know, as strange as this sounds, or maybe it doesn't sound strange, I don't know, that like there's almost a green hand kind of working through me. And anyway, um, at certain points, you know, I would, just, I would just sit there and three hours would go by and I was like, what just came out of my head? That, that sounds okay, but wow, okay. And so um, I just offer it to you guys that way and um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I certainly enjoyed writing it and it's just been an amazing honor for me to see um, that other people seem to enjoy reading it too. Um, but I'd love to get into a conversation with you guys about what you think about these ideas and um, what you think about herbal medicine because I'm sure a lot of you in here, I know a lot of you in here have had experience with that um, and how you think it can kind of help our species move forward, right? Because I think that's the ultimate point. Um, so I think I've talked enough. Um, I'd love to open it up for questions or anything. Yeah. Well, one, one year I, I went out and got nettles and made nettles ravioli with the nettles and I felt like reading that was like the first it felt like I knew what the word tonic meant after I eat them in the spring and they're, they're all around and they're I think they're good for your adrenals so one of the things so the comment is about nettles, nettles and harvesting right. fresh nettles yeah. um, to cook in soup or yeah. to cook in ravioli yeah. and uh, I mean I've been in Italy and you can buy nettle ravioli in the store absolutely yeah, so, you know, nettles are used as an alternative to spinach, and they're one of the first greens of spring. And, um, you know, I, I joke about this a lot, but one of my first experiences with nettle was my dad tossing me into a nettle patch, and this was the middle of summer. Yeah, um, you know, I'll never forget that, and I'll never forget that plant because of it. But um, if you get them now, when they're, you know, they're not ready yet, but they will be, you know, within a few weeks, they're going to start coming up. And you harvest them and you blanch them or um, saute them or braise them, they lose all of their sting. And what you end up with is a really iron-rich, mineralizing tonic that is slightly diuretic, but also very enlivening and stimulating. They do have an, a bit, um, your comment was that they have a bit of an adrenal tonic effect, which means they help us stay strong kind of in the face of stress and pressure. The leaves have a little bit of that, um, but the seeds have it very, very strongly. So we make a nettle seed extract or tincture, or you can actually use the nettle seed fresh like pepper all over your food and it is an amazing adaptogen and improves resilience full of very important oils and highly highly nutritive and lastly you know um, the root is a specific remedy for prostate issues and prostate inflammation but that's a, a little more of a specific disease-based application um, than it is a tonic one but you know nettles nettles didn't make it into the book um, and I thought about it the reason they didn't is because I didn't want kids to end up with hives all over their bodies <laughs> and they take over your garden too like crazy so, but thank you. They're an amazing plant and herbalists love nettles and it kind of goes in like every tea blend we make, you know? Yep. Yes. I think uh, every region has its own herbs that will, and spices that will thrive there. So for instance, in France, you'll have lavender and Morocco, you'll have all the various spices. Do you think there's a relationship there between um, the, the herb and spices that will grow there and the kind of situations yourself will encounter in that region. For instance, like you're talking about cocoa and ginger, but they're not really native to our area. Yeah. Is there a contradiction, or why not use something that has something to offer us? Or yep. What would you say about that? So the question is about um, the difference in medicinal herbs that grow in different places in the world, and um, about how different cultures that live in different places use different plants for treating ailments. Might there be a relationship between the ailments that people experience in that region and the plants that grow there? Um, and is there a contradiction in recommending plants like ginger and chocolate for Vermonters where these plants will never thrive? Yeah. Um, so first of all, to address the last part of the question, because I think the first part is incredibly rich and I, I, I love the, the discussion around that point. I, the reason I included ginger and chocolate is because most people can find them at a grocery store and they're ubiquitous. Um, so yes, they're not necessarily local, but again, you know, the idea of using local medicine is sort of the level two herbalism, right? 
where people are starting to be really mindful of that concept and those ideas. Um, and I really highly encourage that. But think about most people who are living in, um, you know, a, a suburban environment in mainstream America. It's going to be tricky for them to think about digging up their lawn and turning it into an herb garden. Um, they might, and I really encourage that, and I hope that that's what will happen. But the baby step of saying, like, well, look, you can make hot chocolate, and it actually is medicinal, and it's really good for your heart, and it contains these flavonoids that are amazing for cancer prevention and cardiovascular disease prevention. I felt like that was worth it, even though it's not necessarily by a regional remedy. Plus, I went down to Belize and Guatemala, and I saw cacao growing, and the power that emanates from that area, and it just blew my mind. It's this magical place. It's embedded in my psyche in a way that I just can't get rid of. And I also went, was lucky enough to go to Bali in Indonesia and experience ginger there. So another reason why, you know, it's in pretty much every remedy there, ginger. Um, and it makes a lot of sense in that context, but I think it's still useful for Vermonters. So you're right. Um, and could we find varietals like the hawthorn berry that could be used instead of chocolate for, to accomplish the same goals? Absolutely, right? And my point is not that you have to have chocolate and hawthorn and astragalus. My point is that pick a tonic. There is a range of chemical crossover and physiologic action crossover between all these plants where you don't necessarily have to have the exotic goji berry. You can eat Vermont blueberries, and they work really almost just as well. Right? And I think, unfortunately, the natural product industry tries to capitalize a bit on exotic things just because exotic things have always been sexy, I guess. You know, they're from far away and they're expensive. Wow, they must be good for me. And I don't really buy that. Blueberries are awesome, right? So you can get a lot of what you get out of chocolate from blueberries, for instance. Um, but I just love chocolate, and I love ginger. <laughs> so. Now, to get to the other part of your question, which is about do different plants grow in different regions that might sort of dovetail with the people that live there and the ailments they experience, um, I fully believe that, right? And so when we talk about Linden, for instance, I spent time researching what goes on in Provence which is, you know, kind of the place where lavender is best known. And, you know, Linden is a close second. Tilleul, which you, Tilleul, oh, okay. right? Which is made into a tea, but it's also made into bath sachets and milled into soap. And anyway, it's, it's like if lavender is number one fragrance, Linden is number two. It's like right under there. Um, and what's interesting about these plants is that they're really nice to take, the aromatic plants, when you feel like tired and hot in the middle of August in Provence. They really open things up, help you cool off, and release a lot of tension. So yeah, I kind of think that, you know, and then you see what kind of plants grow up in here in Vermont, and you see, you know, American ginseng and golden seal growing in the woods. Um, these plants that are really powerful, that are used for, you know, bad infections and for really depleted situations that you might experience, you know, from trying to live out here on the front, rocky frontier where it's very difficult to cultivate stuff. Um, so yeah, I think plants and the ecology adapts itself around the people that live there as well, and the animals that live there as well. What's so fascinating to me is that depending, you know, it gets even more subtle than that. Because let's say we have a drought season, or we have a season that is very wet. Plants will change the chemistry that they express based on those environmental conditions. Flavonoids are a great example. Flavonoids protect the human system from the effects of starvation, for instance. And they're overexpressed in plants when plants experience drought and overly intense ultraviolet radiation. Goldenrod makes more bioflavonoids. Blueberries and hawthorn berries express more bioflavonoids and anthocyanidins. To protect themselves, but if we eat them, we get a jump on the environmental change that's going to mess with us. So again, like these phytochemicals, these plant chemicals, if you consider the ecology as one being, these are the hormones of that ecology. It's the way the different pieces of the ecology signals between these different kingdoms. You know, we call it cross-kingdom signaling. And the plants are the ones that are really doing it. I think we're doing it too a little bit, but these days we are like putting antidepressants in the water and that's the kind of signaling we're putting out there. I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, we just don't know what's going to come of it, right? But historically, you know, human poop and human pee and dead human beings participate in the ecology by putting chemistry back in. Um, but I think the plant to animal connection is a lot more powerful, right? Because plants are, they're embedded in that soil and they're feeling that air and experiencing that water and they change their chemistry based on that and then we eat them and it changes the way our cells express the blueprint that is embedded in the DNA on a moment-to-moment -moment on a day-to-day -day basis. 
And so again, ultimately, even though I start suggesting chocolate, my hope is that people will really grow or wild harvest the plants that I talk about because it's the ones that are in their backyard, that are in the woods in their local environment. They're the ones that are trying to say, hey, listen to me. I'm going to help you out here. I'm going to help make sure that you're at your ultimate, most vibrant, healthy state. And I'm going to do it through these plant chemicals that are attuned to the environment that you're living in. So not only will you as a sort of generic human be better off, but you'll also be better off as part of this ecology that is one single organism, right? Which again, you know, goes back to the idea of why are we buying these processed pills that come from who knows where with ingredients that are made in China that are sometimes of questionable provenance, right? Or they may contain amphetamines. The FDA is now cracking down on these sort of athletic performance supplements because they find amphetamines inside them, which is just nuts to me, right? We've got these plants. Anyway, so I hope that kind of addresses your question a little bit. But I think the bioregional medicine, <laughs> really important. There's one mushroom. I talk about 12 plants and one fungus, um, reishi mushroom. Um, and I mention that one because, especially up here in Vermont, it's almost impossible to mistake it with anything else. It's shiny bright red, and it only pretty much grows on hemlock trees. So you're not going to hurt yourself harvesting it. But I grew up in Europe. You know, my dad would take me out at 4 in the morning before the sunrise, you know, and I'm sitting there like half awake. I'm like, what are we doing? Oh, my God, not again. And he's like, no, 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 we got to get out there before the other people do. We got to get out there before the other mushroom hunters get there. And, you know, we go out and we get baskets full of all sorts of different mushrooms, um, which um, are amazing medicine, amazing medicine. And the signaling that comes to us from the kingdom fungi is perhaps, I would say, as important, if not more important, than the signaling that comes from the plant kingdom. But um, Paul Stamets, if you've never read any of his work, has gone into detail about that. And I really felt like I couldn't treat the subject better than he could. Um, in terms of the medicinal effect of mushrooms on the human physiology. And um, it's amazing, amazing stuff. Now, that said, you know, I, I, I've railed on my dad a couple times here, um, but I remember the day when he said to me at 5.30 in the morning when we were out there in the woods, okay, it's your turn to lead the mushroom walk. And I was like, what? I'm going to get to go look for them? Okay. And that just like felt like such an honor to me. It was almost like in a moment of initiation, you know, so... That's the other thing that I think herbal medicine can do for us is it can connect us more to nature and it can connect us more to empowerment around health, which, you know, if you talk to any primary care physician or anyone really in the conventional technological medicine world, it's something we really need. We need people to be able to take more responsibility for their health. And I think herbal medicine does that. Um, messes with your head in a good way. But yeah, Paul Stamets and fungi. That would be my recommendation. Um, mycelium running is a great thick tome on that. Yeah, way in the back. So the question is on um, herbal tinctures, which are alcohol extracts of plants. And uh, the idea of taking a few drops of this alcohol-based extract, um, is it more or less potent than brewing a cup of tea um, for the same plant? And unfortunately, it's not a straightforward answer. Um, it depends on the chemistry of the plant, okay? So, for example, the aromatic plants that have this great aroma and scent, they actually extract pretty well in water. They make ridiculously good tinctures, too. Um, but they extract really well in water, and sitting over a cup of linden tea and just breathing in that aroma, I think, is a valuable medicinal experience. And, you know, drop for drop, you're getting more out of a tincture, but think about how much more tea you drink. So ultimately, in terms of botanical material, you actually get more of it from a tea. So often the reason I recommend a tincture is either for convenience or because it tastes god-awful nasty, right? So do you want to brew a cup of wormwood tea? No. The stuff is disgusting. Part of the reason for taking it is that it is disgusting, right? And so you take five, ten drops on your tongue, you go blah, 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 and all your digestive system processes wake up. That's really, really valuable. And you don't have to drink, you know, a pint of this nasty green-brown liquid. So I try to make that distinction clear in the book where it's like this plant lends itself very well to hydroalcoholic tincturing. This other plant makes a fantastic tea. This plant you can use both applications, depending on what you're trying to go after. For some folks, um, having a tincture, which is just really easy to do, you guys, you know, I can give you the herbal tincture workshop right now. Chop plant, pour vodka, 
shake for one month, strain. Okay? <laughs> Pretty easy. It's a matter of convenience, right? So you take this stuff in a two ounce bottle, in a four ounce bottle, you can bring it with you traveling. Well, two ounce bottle if it's an airplane, please. Right? And then you can have it um, in your purse or in your pocket without having to bring all these bulk herbs and your tea ball and your teapot and your mug. Right? But if you're at home, a lot of times um, a cup of tea is really the way to go. And a tincture that's bitter, like a dandelion root tincture, you can take dandelion roots and roast them in a cast iron skillet. And um, if they're finely enough chopped, you can brew them in a drip coffee maker and make a really good beverage that's basically like a tea. Um, put a little cream and sugar in there, it's fantastic. Or maybe just cream and not sugar. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Um, there's applications for both tea and tinctures. There's certain plants that really are only ever going to be taken as a tincture. Partly because of flavor, partly because of the potency of their chemistry. Like I wouldn't brew a belladonna tea. I would make a tincture and I would make it consistent and I would only take three, you know, six drops of it. But there's others that, you know, I don't know that I would ever want to make a linden tincture or a chamomile tincture. You can and it's fine and they go well in herbal formulas, but the tea is just so delicious and beautiful and an experience to have. The ritual of tea making itself is so valuable that, that that's kind of the direction that I would go with it. The question is around um, plants like eucalyptus that have very strong aromas and are rich in essential oils and other plants as well that may be very powerful. Um, if they have these powerful benefits, let's say, what are potentially the risks or side effects associated with them? How can we jump into this art and science of herbal medicine safely, um, knowing that if plants have benefit, they might also have risks? And I have a couple of answers to that. You know, first of all, eucalyptus taken off the tree and brewed into tea or even processed into a tincture. I don't know what research you're referencing specifically that shows its negative benefits, but I bet it's looking at essential oil, yeah. right? And essential oil is a distillate of the plant that is highly, highly concentrated. And you know, we can talk about peppermint essential oil. The best example of this is pennyroyal essential oil, okay? Pennyroyal is a plant in the mint family. You can make a tea of it. It's antispasmodic, it soothes the belly, it relaxes tension, right? But take five to 10 drops of pennyroyal essential oil internally and you could die. It can be neurotoxic, okay? The same is true of thujone in wormwood, the major ingredient of absinthe. It can cause gangrene, it can clamp down peripheral circulation, um, it can be neurotoxic, it's bad news. But these are highly concentrated extracts of the plant that are very difficult to produce at home. Okay? And you can definitely see toxicity when that happens. And it's basically like the route that pharmaceuticals have taken, right? They've, you know, still 40 to 60% of pharmaceuticals are plant-based today. And they take these ingredients from the plants and they concentrate them. And it's when you do that that you end up seeing a much higher side effect to benefit ratio. But when the plants are used whole, you see that a whole heck of a lot less. They're also milder, all right? But, you know, in my opinion, that's a decent trade-off. Um, now, that said, there are, there are definitely some plants that, even when consumed in their whole form, you know, I've used the example of belladonna many times tonight, um, are very unsafe. But that's what I've tried to do because I recognize that concern of yours, and I think it's a common concern in the American public. Um, I've tried to focus on plants that you could eat 50 times the recommended amount and have no issues whatsoever. They're very food-like. Hawthorn berries and blueberries, you know, you overdo it on blueberries, you can eat, you know, five cups of blueberries when you go home tonight, you probably have a little bit of loosening of your bowel, <laughs> right? That's a lot of fiber, okay? Um, but other than that, you're going to be okay. And the benefits, my point is that they can have immediate benefits if your physiology is out of balance, right? If you're experiencing a lot of inflammation or with blueberries in the case of diabetes, if there's poor peripheral circulation, the small blood vessels get damaged in advanced type 2 diabetes and you tend to see issues with um, retinal blood vessels, blood vessels in the feet, blood vessels in the heart. Blueberries will help with that. They'll help push that back, right? But my hope is that this is also a multi-generational fix that we're starting to do today, you know, that we're starting to do with herbal medicine. That we'll see some modest but useful health benefits from using these safe plants. And that if our kids see us using them and their kids grow up using them, after a couple generations, we'll turn back this weirdness that the last 200 years has brought into the Western developed world, if that makes sense. So it's really a multi-generational thinking 
that herbal medicine employs. And we talk about you know, the Native American idea of uh, thinking seven generations into the future whenever you make a decision. And part of our decision making process now is like, let's bring these allies back so that our grandkids' grandkids are healthy. And the beauty of it is, is that in the short term, we experience better health too. And I've really tried to focus on plants that don't interact with pharmaceuticals, that are super safe even at really high doses, so you can get started with this core safe set of plants and experience benefits right away with no worries about safety. Okay? Um, and I, I reference the research that shows that they're safe. And we have that modern research, but we also have um, the thousands of years of traditional use record, which I think is really valuable and important too. And again, when you compare herbal medicines to everything else that's on the shelf out there, we have high degree of effectiveness and high degree of safety, um, which to me is, it makes it kind of a no-brainer. But yeah, concentrated preparations like eucalyptus essential oil should be approached with caution and under supervision. I think you're correct about that. The internal use of any essential oil is highly suspect in, in, in high concentrations. You got to be careful. There's certainly applications for it. You know, we use tea tree oil and sandalwood oil internally as antifungals. But I wouldn't recommend doing that, you know, tonight just for fun. Okay. Anything else, you guys? Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, again, I just want to honor you for your interest in herbal medicine. Um, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, and I hope you will try, you know, one aromatic, one bitter, and one tonic plant at some point this year, because I know you'll experience benefits from it. Um, and the plants will really appreciate it too. <laughs> did you? Did you? Well, yeah, the correlationship between using a leaf and the, the relationship between the plant and the plant and the plant, and where in the body. That I haven't found quite as clear of a connection. A lot of bitter plants are roots, um, and a lot of aromatic plants are leaves and flowers. So maybe, you know, the, the old alchemists would talk about, you know, flowers being soul and spirit, right. roots being like body and digestion. Right. And, and, you know, that makes sense to me to a certain extent. Um, they also associated elements with them, you know, from the root being earth element to the seed being fire element, the leaves, water, and the flower, air. You know, it smelled, it carried a smell on the air. Um, and those are very interesting, but I haven't, I take those with a grain of salt because it's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence and it doesn't always hold true. There are some really um, bitter greens like wormwood or dandelion leaf, and there's some really highly aromatic roots like angelica root that are um, spicy and have a lot of essential oil in them. So I don't know. But yeah, it, it's, it's a good point. So thanks. Um, but that's, you know, you'll start investigating herbal medicine more and you'll start to make these connections. And, and what matters to you and what makes sense to you, you'll like build this plant-human relationship. And that's to me what the most beautiful part of all of this is, right? And when you do that, it's really hard to look at a sterile cornfield and say like, that looks okay to me. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to look at a dandelion in a garden bed and say, well, that belongs. I like that, that makes sense. And if we do that, we'll increase garden biodiversity, we'll increase ecological biodiversity, and so we're not just healing human beings, we're not just doing multi-generational work on human culture, we're also healing ecology, we're busting back on the, on the um, agricultural industrial complex and the petrochemicals that drive it. You know, we become like weeds ourselves, which to me is the most beautiful part of all of this. You know, we're pushing through the pavement, pushing through the cracks, and helping usher the human species into like the next turn of the spiral, right? So again, thanks for being there, y'all. Um, and helping with that. Yeah. Thanks.